One of the hardest things to convince others of is the idea that people can change. You know, we believe it can happen for those people over there who have inspirational books or movies or stories out, but we don't believe it can happen for these people over here. Not that you guys are any different, but still. Um, but we don't believe that change is possible for everyone and that it's sustainable. And I think for most of us, if we're honest, we'll find that we make judgments about people quite quickly. We see this from the beginning of Christianity in the Acts of the Apostles today. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Granted, they had good reason. Saul, later known as Paul, was actively persecuting Christians and overseeing their slaughter. But even those who were ardent followers of Jesus and saw that all that Saul was doing for the church, even they were still hesitant to think that change was possible. And was it all a fake? I remember earlier this year when I spoke about rapper Kanye West or pop star Justin Bieber's growing in faith in Jesus, and many were skeptical. Have they really changed? Nah, people thought, let's scrutinize their every word and action until we find something to discredit their newfound conversion. And when I Google Christian reaction to Justin Bieber, I found articles dated seven years ago when he first started talking about Christ and people said, oh, this is just a PR stunt. He's going to revert. Remember him vandalizing neighbors, spending time in jail, or his Insta story feed of parties, scantily clad models and drinking? Like, he's going to go back to that. Yet I find it encouraging that as lately as a month ago, he released a gospel EP in which of his songs, Afraid to Say, says, God never writes us off, even in our darkest days, even when we least deserve it, even when we're doing stupid things we wish we weren't doing. He's with us in our pain. He's with us in our struggle. He's with us in our bad decisions. He's with us all the time. God never writes us off. St. John in the second reading assures us that despite our past, God is greater than our hearts and knows everything, yet he still calls us beloved. But this idea that it's impossible to change is not just something we hold for celebrities or people who have hurt us really bad, such as estranged family members, difficult bosses or co-workers, or just people in life who has caused us pain and misery. We also fall into the lie ourselves. You see, change is a process, and that's perhaps why people are hesitant to believe, because change is not just a one-time poof and you're magically all ready. Even for those who have a profound conversion, God works with us over time to bring about even greater perfection. Change is not a one-time, but a lifelong process. And that's why Jesus says today, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit and everyone that does, he prunes so that it bears more fruit. I remember the first time that I learned about pruning. My grandmother has these big, beautiful roses in her front yard, and it's literally the talk of the neighborhood. But these roses didn't grow up to be big, bright, and big, and beautiful on their own. And I remember to my initial horror, because I do not have a green thumb and I know nothing about gardening, that one day as I was watching her water her garden, that she started to cut off big branches and sometimes reduce the plant to such a small size. And when I asked her why, she showed me the places where she had pruned before, the new shoots and the buds that were growing from the now pruned branches. And if she didn't do it, the branches would have grown too big, the flowers, she said, would have been smaller, the leaves and petals would eventually lose their bright color, so pruning led to the rose bush bearing not only more flowers, but also cultivating healthy, strong plants that are flourishing in the midst of a desert. The same with our spiritual lives. 
If we wish to grow spiritually, we have to follow Jesus' command today to remain and abide in Him, but also to allow ourselves to be pruned. And as we follow Jesus and come to know Him personally, we will at times have to hear Him call to us to submit to the pruning knife, to cut out those things in our life that without doing so would never lead us to develop into strong branches that bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. Pruning for us could look like removing major sins in our lives. Sometimes we need to be pruned from certain destructive habits that have developed over time, pornography, intimate relationships outside of marriage, gossiping, jealousy, comparisons, impatience, or attachments that we place before God. Pruning might come in the form of removing certain toxic relationships in our lives that are not leading us towards holiness. And at first, this pruning process feels painful. It feels hurtful. What are you doing, God? Even very much like death. But in the end, they help us grow into strong, faithful disciples. Lately, I've been fascinated by the life of Dorothy Day, an American journalist who died only about 40 years ago, and she was once someone who defined herself according to what political party she belonged to rather than her faith, and so she called herself an ardent communist. She followed the lifestyle of her friends, which included having a series of sexual partners. She had one of her children aborted, and got to such a low point in her life that she attempted suicide. And it was at this point that she started to reevaluate her life and tried to find happiness in a civil marriage and in the birth of her daughter. Yet the happiness that she thought she would find even from turning from a life of major sins was not satisfied. She wanted more. So she began attending mass and decided to have her child baptized, decisions that her partner reviled which ultimately led to her separation and divorce. So after her separation, she was constantly being pruned again, so she founded the Catholic Worker Movement, a movement of solidarity with the poor. She started to find peace and happiness in her work for justice. She stood up for the poor. She started to, um, she was even shot at for her work against racism. She helped women And she discovered that one of the most racist institutions in America was the abortion industry as a disproportionately larger number of black women and poor women had children aborted compared to their white counterparts. And so she worked to take care of all of them, all of the poor, all of the marginalized, all of those that were discriminated against. And she didn't fit into the traditional mold of what we think saints should be. One who's had an abortion, one who's had a divorce, Yet for Dorothy Day, change was possible, and it was a lifelong process. And Dorothy found her strength in daily mass and commitment to contemplative prayer. And despite her past, now in the church, she is called a servant of God. She's on the way to becoming a saint and declared by the church to be a saint. You see, Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in in you, Ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. Today, let us beg Jesus for a change of our hearts. Change is possible for everyone as long as we remain grafted onto Jesus, who is our life-giving source. And it is his life within us that transforms us, purifies us, changes us, so that we may one day enter into a life of love and happiness that God, our Savior, our loving Father, has planned for us for all eternity.